Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and thanks for joining me again today for another episode of the podcast in support of the documentary film, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. Today I've got a special treat for you, yet again, more stories. And what I want to dig into today are some things that aren't going to be in the film because we compiled close to 100 hours of interviews and got some amazing stories and some amazing recounts. And so much of it just can't be in the film because even over three um, episodes of the film, which will total about four, four and a half hours in total, you can see we're barely scratching the surface of mining all the material in the interviews that totaled close to 100 hours. So what I want to do is pull out some of my favorites today, share them with you, and have you enjoy some things that ended up on the cutting room floor. And first, let me start with showing you a little clip of the trailer for the film, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier. Who doesn't love a rags to riches story? But a rags to riches to collapse story? There were two Evans furs. The one that climbed to the top of the highest peak, amazing story, and the one that tumbled from that peak decades later. But that's not the tragedy. The tragedy is what happened in between. They lived the American dream, and they let a lot of people come in and live it with them. And it was a wonderful story until it wasn't. Coming from a, a generation that was so driven and willing to work 18 hours a day to be successful, there aren't that many people like that anymore. Like they created something out of whole cloth and he helped kings and queens around the world with their fur coats. That was the era, uh, I would say, the golden era of department stores and specialty stores. Genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. Non-existent parenting, and so they didn't learn how to cope with stresses. And I just look at the damage that my father created and the things that he has said. But it certainly caused a, a significant rift in the family and families and, and you know, a number of us didn't communicate with each other for a long time. You marry into the family, you marry into the business because that is your life. Clearly, there were problems. Okay, so I can't wait for you to see that. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours spent uh, putting that together for you. So, really, really insightful. I hope you find it as well. So first, let's start with a story by Evan's former vice president and fur merchandise manager, Sharon Bass, who before she came into the fur division was the general merchandise manager for apparel. And one of the things that definitely doesn't get spoken about in the film, because we're focusing on the Meltzer family and the Evans Fur Company as a whole, is the Evans Apparel Division. And the Evans Apparel Division in Chicago was actually larger in volume and in sales and in transactions than the fur department was. So here, Sharon Bass recounts for us how Evans Furs got into the apparel knits business in the 70s and early 80s and how massive of a business it was for the company at that time. Evans was a great, great store. And at that point, though, I had moved up because I was a buyer now, and I had an office on the fourth floor, which was 
a big shop floor and I was always helping with, um, knits were a very big thing in those days, knits, knit outfits, whether they were pants or dresses, pants were becoming then kind of more popular. It was a long time ago. So people weren't wearing that much pants, but they were starting to. And I remember when we would have those, we would open on a Sunday and we had to be there at the crack of dawn and we would start putting these, these knits out and we would sell so many, Scott. Oh my God. We just kept taking them from the back and putting them in the front, taking them from the back and putting them in the front. And I mean, we, we would have the biggest days from, I think they probably sold for, I might be lying about this, but I don't think that these things sold for more than, it was maybe about $70 for, you know, a pants set. But they were lined up outside. They were lined up waiting to get in. Because, like you say, my neighbors would talk about this. Oh, Evans has such lovely clothes. And he has such, and it wasn't just the, the coats that, and, the, and the dresses and, and the sportswear. They were also coming to, for the furs. But at that point, was it, what was important to me was the apparel. So that's what we were, that's what I was there killing myself for. Killing myself for. But I, th I believe, well, I know that they got so involved with the knits was because they were going, David Meltzer and all of his cronies were going over to the Orient and they started seeing that they could do these knits and that's how they got so involved in that and started doing that. No one else was really doing that, but Evan started doing it and it was all because of the furs. I do believe that people came into the shops in the malls because of apparel, but they would wind up buying eventually a fur when they were when they were coming into the stores. Not every single time, obviously, but people would shop repeatedly for the apparel in the Chicago stores. I mean, they just loved Evans apparel. They just loved it, and I we had a least shoe department and that did a lot of business also i don't i have no idea how much but i i, I was well, trying to do I, I know it was millions what they did in shoes also so it was a very big i remember that um stevens was another competitor of ours apparel competitor and they did we it was a freestanding apparel only store right down the block on state street from us and we did like comparable businesses and I think they actually had a few more stores than we did, but we, we were very competitive and, but a lot of it was, a lot of it was these knits that really got us going in apparel. Yeah, definitely something that gets lost in translation there. I mean, I remember walking into the uh, lobby of the building at 36 South State Street, which had two sets of elevators, uh, the first set when you entered, went up to the uh, upper floors where all the offices were, and there were many tenants that weren't a part of Evans. And then when you walked into the store section, the second set of elevators that went up to the uh, first through fifth floor were the store elevators. And when they would have these apparel sales, I remember in the 80s how crammed it was, and you couldn't even get to the elevators to um, get to the first lawn. So speaking of which, one of the things that also will not have time to get spoken about in the documentary films, uh, Skin on Skin, The Rise and Fall of the World's Largest Furrier, are some of the real characters that made up Evans. Here, I just want to share with you a short clip that my cousin Robert Meltzer recounts about possibly the most colorful person ever at Evans Furs. His name was Sam Mellon. He was maybe the greatest fur salesman you ever saw. However, there was one small problem, as you'll see my cousin recount about Sam Mella. People wanted to be supportive and people wanted to see a successful company. And that is not always the case. It's not something you can take for granted. Uh, it, was really, it was really a great place to work in many ways. And I think the biggest thing about it was the fact that you had people who had been there for many, many years and were devoted to it. Yeah, I remember uh, there were so many characters there, too. Uh, for a lot of people. 
there was there was, there was a uh, salesman at the State Street store by the name of Sam Mellon, uh, and, which was not, of course, his real name. I don't think I ever knew his real name, but they anglicized everybody's name in the 1950s, and he'd probably been there from the time he was 20 years old on. And you you literally couldn't understand what the hell he was saying when he was talking to women, but women just loved him because he was suave and he was smooth and he was nice. Uh, it was one after another. I could name 20 characters out of that business. And, and, and you know, I think there was a, a level of acceptance and assuredness that the company had that made people feel comfortable there. And people really devoted their lives to it. People stayed there forever. You know, well, I mean, people didn't realize it because it was a very large fur business, but the apparel business in Chicago was much larger than the fur business. Uh, and, you know, so there were a lot of people who didn't even think of Evans as a fur company in Chicago, but they did think of it as a, as a big retail store. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of competitors uh, 40, 50 years ago that were similar, where they were homegrown retail stores, and they've all gone by the wayside. When I was a really little kid, the elevators were all still manually operated in that building, and there were steel grates, and uh, his office was in the corner of the fifth floor. I would come in on Saturday mornings after dance class, and I would come into the building, and I'm on the first floor, and there's an open elevator, open cage elevator in those days. And I remember going to visit him, and he was so mad at somebody in his office that day. Maybe I was seven or eight years old. My father's on the fifth floor, and I could hear him yelling at somebody from the first floor. That I could hear him screaming at somebody from the first floor lobby elevator coming from the fifth floor. I remember hearing him scream at people in his office, and I was all the way out by the elevator through closed doors. But after he got done yelling, he was a pussycat. And I walked into that office, and it was like he had never raised his voice. It was like a Jekyll and Hyde. Um, but on the other hand, people, everybody at the, in the company, both respected and, and admired him. You know, um, the fur industry and the apparel industry in general are um dying crafts dying arts that you know so much is being done by machines anymore in the old days this was all done by hand especially in the fur business a lot of these garments were constructed and sewn literally by hand with some help of machines uh later on but they were really rudimentary machines and there was so much uh hand involvement manual involvement even at that point so here mike liliacakis who's one of the vendors that Evans dealt with and who is so kind to contribute some great comments to the film, which you'll see when you see the film about Evans and the market at the time. I just want to share with you the lifelong artistry and pursuit that many of these people went into as Mike talks about getting into the fur business and working his way up the ladder. Nice. I started as a floor boy, sweeping the floor, making deliveries, making coffee, do the all odd works. I knew nothing about furs. Then uh, slowly, you know, I was watching how they were doing things. They doing the sewing, the nailing. Uh, I was stretching the skins. And slowly, within a year, a year and a half, I learned how to be an operator, how to do the sewing. And I did the sewing for a couple of years, then I wanted to learn more. So I learned how to match, how to do setups, uh, how to make a garment from the very beginning, getting a skin that give you whatever you need, wear a stole, a jacket, a coat. And uh, that's how I got ahead. This was in 1959, 58. And I had the urgency to do, do better for myself. So I learned everything I could learn from nailing to everything. That's why I became a contractor. And uh, 
I became a very good contractor. One of the best this market had. One time he said to a guy, there's three kinds of people in this world. Those who make things happen, those who watch what happens, and those who wonder what happened. I want you to be the number one. I want you to, I want you to make things happen here. They'd all come out to Yorktown because that was the second store in Chicago. You know, first was River Oaks and then there was Yorktown. And they didn't really know what to expect, you know, when they opened up all these stores in the suburb. Really, like I said, a, a lost and dying art. Uh, next up, I want to uh, show you a clip uh, from one of the people who um, was at Evans for many, many moons. I think I think Marty Cohen said he was there for 27 years or 30, 37 years. I forget how long he said, decades. Uh, one of the things that anybody who remembers working at Evans uh, in the 80s, 70s and 80s and prior will remember, uh, and, and really actually if you worked anywhere in retail in the pre-computer days, you will remember how much we did manually to keep track of things, whether it was inventory and also in the case of Evans, our customers' garments, when they brought them in for first storage and cleaning in the spring, and we were responsible for seeing that they got them back in the fall. One of the amazing things at Evans downtown Chicago was on the fifth floor, their service operation, which took in thousands and thousands of coats. Come the end of the season, somehow they managed to put back in the hands of about 25,000 customers the exact same garment that they brought in earlier in the spring. And when you hear Marty explain the system that we used to use, the manual system on index cards, it's a miracle that these people ever got their furs back in the fall. An L Trans book that Colleen Jackson moved furs by hand, little index cards that were in the store's inventory. And then when she get the paperwork, she'd take that little card out and move it to Philadelphia from Yorktown. Well, you'd call me. We had, we, we, you'd have, yeah, I guess you'd have to call her to see where everything is. But, um, you know, you'd, you'd really call, at the time that you needed, you didn't call her, you called, you called me or you called Michael Lerman or you called somebody who had, so she's not getting 80 calls from different people. That was just something that we offered the customer. If we didn't have her size, in, but we could get it and she wanted the coat, we would make the, the, we'd make the, uh, the call to get the coat and then call her when we got the coat in, which was only a matter of a couple of days. We started to get uh, in, um, computerized. And then it was very easy because we had giant books to tell you where the coats were. Now the books were only good for a week, but you got a new one all the time. And then by that time, com computers, when I say the book, that showed all the inventory in all the stores. So you could look and see where your size eight that you need is. So before we go on, let me take a moment and uh, show you another trailer. This is from Skin on Skin, the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier part two. And it really picks right up where part one leaves off, as you'll see. and Rose Meltzer went forward with the belief that their son's death was an accident. And this setback rocked the family during a time when brother A.L. and Herman's Evans Furs was skyrocketing to the top of the industry. 
those Meltzer kids obviously weren't taught how to cope or how to parent or, or you know, relationship skills were really lacking, and that got passed down. All I know is that he had a photograph of him where he was brilliant, and the family loved him. Yeah, I think she loved the way I looked, so she was always, you know, like, I was her little doll. All of his grandchildren wrote reports on Nuremberg at some point in school. You know, someone would always have an assignment, interview some relative about something. Nonchalantly would toss a question out and the, the beads of sweat were pouring off as he's trying to answer Uncle Bernie's question. A lot of people live in fear that, you know, oh my God, is that going to happen to me? In the end, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of customers got hurt. It was just a bad thing. These are this dinosaur, you know, toy dinosaur on the table, and he says, you know what happened to these dinosaurs? It was a, a, a very unique era. Jeff and I got some calls, and people were just savvy. Well, they shut the doors on people. That was pretty high profile. A fish has got to swim and an eagle's got to soar. That's their natural temperament and how they want to live and how they want to play. And when that's blocked, people are really unhappy. I so can't wait for you all to see these films. I really can. So the last thing I want to share with you today is something really special. If you've been following these podcasts, you'll recall that a couple of episodes ago, I showed you the entire interview I did with Robert Sakowitz, who is the CEO and grandson of the founders of Sakowitz Stores out of Houston, Texas. They were a competitor of Neiman Marcus. They took a, a, a similar trajectory as Evans Furs did, both in their climb and in their demise. And again, if you saw it, one of the most fascinating interviews that, that we've seen. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage it. Anyways, another Texas legend in the retail industry was involved in Evans. His name was Robert Coslow. And Bob Coslow owned a couple of fur salons in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that had an amazing reputation uh, of being the, the place to go for the hoi polloi in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Evans Furs bought out Bob Coslow and took over the, the stores and expanded the chain into multiple states, including other stores in Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, and uh, New Orleans. And, and it was really an amazing company that Bob Coslow built. We'll hear Chris Nielsen, who was one of the general managers down in Texas and in the Dallas store and had plenty of occasion to meet and see and watch Bob Coslow in action recounts a truly unique and remarkable man, the kind that does not exist in retail any longer. Yeah, yeah no, he, uh, I met him in Fort Worth when I was working in Fort Worth. And uh, you could always tell he was going to come in because you could smell his cologne halfway down the block. He uh, <laughs> he had this cologne made for him, and uh, it was done with, you know, the whole body wrap and his own essence and all this kind of stuff. And uh, and so it was it was very strong. He wore a lot of it. And we always kidded that he bathed in it. But you could tell the second he got to, like, the corner around outside the building, you could start to smell this cologne. And so then when he came in, but he was always a very nice man, very gracious, very, uh, you know, knew everybody in the building type thing. He was very, he was a people person for sure. Did you uh, tell that's, did, that's how he made his four. Did Seymour or any of the long timers there talk about his lore and what he had built or anything? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Kenny first, God bless him. Uh, you know, he was, he was great. He was a great mentor for me. And, uh, and I still miss him to this day. And, and they talked about Bob Coslow and what he brought. And, you know, he still brought a customer to the building every once in a while. And he still liked to help and wait on people. He liked to come in on your sale while you're, uh, while you're working with somebody to come in and introduce him. I mean, who doesn't want to know the guy whose name was on the building? But he was, like I said, he was, a, he was everybody's best friend. He was a very gracious guy. And we were always very glad to see him. Anyways, truly a coincidence having that picture of the dinosaur come up right before I went to the clip of Bob Coslow. There was nothing intended there, although it looked pretty funny, didn't it? We had apparel. We had uh, coats, dresses, sportswear, shoes. And at that time, we had cosmetics in the front like per all sorts of perfumes and stuff in the front, in the cases. And we even had lingerie. They didn't come to Evans for that. They came, you know, my father used to say, people will drive 50 miles to buy an Evans fur. They won't drive 10 miles to buy an Evans dress. And that shipping all these coats out, then the people came in to get the coats. And then we had to replace a lot of them. And I was basically, I was running the, you know, the going out of business and store closing at downtown and it was broke. And, you know, I had customers come in crying, telling me they're, I had one woman, she sat there. She said, I'm coming in here and I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. This old lady, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to kill you. And all your people with a gun, I'm going to blow your fucking brains out. And I said, holy shit. So it was because we couldn't find her coat. You know, you had people, you had people like Tony Grykus. You know, I'd call Tony and say, you have this coat? Let me look in the computer. I said, don't you, don't you look in the computer. You go in the goddamn vault, and I want to know if you have it in your hands. Then, But don't tell me you have it. And you go in the vault and you don't. And then I got a customer to come back here and and tell them that they don't that we lost their coat. You, I want to know that you have it in the vault in your hand that you're going to send it to me tomorrow. And that happened. You have to have it in your hand because you had the computer system was sucked. That if they took it out, you know, everything went from State Street back out to Hillside. And if you didn't have it in your hand, you didn't know. You know, and I had a fight with Tony so many times that, you know, he didn't want to, he said, no, I, 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 it said it's here, but I don't, I want to know physically. Do you have it in your hand? So there's some things from the cutting room floor that definitely will make the film because the film is about the rise and fall of Evans Furs, but it, more importantly, if you've seen the film and when you see the film, you'll understand it's about the Meltzer family. It's about family in general, for which I'm sure you'll all see yourself and your own families in the film. And it's about a different time and a different way of doing things. And it's about the challenges that immigrants meet still to this day when they come to this country to make a better life for themselves. So until next week, I'm Scott Hunter, and I thank you for joining me on the podcast for Skin on Skin the rise and fall of the world's largest furrier. See you next time. Have a great day.